We've got your Raiders covered. Knock on wood if you're with me. It's Silver and Black today on CBS Sports Radio 1140. And now, here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Welcome. Happy Championship Sunday, everybody. That's right. AFC, NFC Championship games are today. Of course, the Raiders are not there, unfortunately, for everybody who listens to the show. Next year. <laughs> As your Raiders fans. Welcome back to Las Vegas' only all Raiders talk show. And that, of course, is Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. I'm Scott Branson, joined by my co-hosts, Kelly Kreiner and Chaz Osborne. We'll get to them in a second. Busy, busy show as usual today. It doesn't matter if it's the quote-unquote offseason, uh, but there's lots going on. There's secret meetings at UFC matches between quarterbacks and Mark Davis. We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> but first, a couple things before I, I bring in uh, my worthy co-hosts here. Uh, I want to talk about this day in Raider history. Now, our good friend AFL Godfather on Twitter, who I know all the Raider fans follow, great guy, um, and does an amazing job of history. And he he reminded me of a bunch of history today for January 19th in Raiders history. It's a very huge day yeah, for, for two really good reasons and one really bad reason. So we're going to bring that to you. So January 19th, 1963, besides being Chaz's birthday. Sheesh, 63. Let me write this down. <laughs> Happy birthday, Chaz. You 56? Wow. No. Um, the Raiders name Al Davis head coach and general manager. Pretty big day in Raiders history, Chaz. Smart move. I mean. A, was that a three-year deal, his first deal? <laughs> I think no, it was. Seriously, I think yeah. it, it was just like a three-year deal. It was one of those things where I don't think anybody really knew, yeah. had any idea what it was going to turn into. No, and 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 but but Al Davis had the focus, right, Kelly? But that what a monumental day, dude. Yeah, right. Yeah. Pretty big day. They didn't in, know in they were starting there. No, they didn't. They did not know. Uh, but certainly, without him, uh, the franchise, the brand, <laughs> wouldn't be. Yeah, nobody saw what was coming. coming. <laughs> uh, nobody could hey. predict what was coming next. All right, so now for the not so happy moment on January nineteenth, and this, of course, happened in the year of. 2002, the Raiders make a trip out to Foxborough, Massachusetts for the AFC Divisional Playoff game. <coughs> Pardon me. Excuse me. Wow. Yeah, that's buttons. good that you choked. Um, <laughs> How fitting. <laughs> hey, that wasn't our fault, man. Was, Tuck rule. What kind of rule was that? Well, Everybody yeah. knows it was a fumble. They had a picture of his hand on the ball. It was a fumble. No, nah, Perry I mean, Mason, we, case closed. I, I know I'm anti-Raider person when I say this here, but it's just a stupid rule that was called correctly. And uh, I've said it before. I quit complaining about the tuck rule yep. when the same thing happened to me on Madden football. <laughs> what? Yeah, I sacked a qu- – yeah, the funny thing was it was the Patriots I was playing as the Raiders. Right. The exact same play, the exact same thing happened. The computer challenges it <laughs> and overturns it. So I'm like, all right, if Madden football says that's what happens, that's what happens. Madden but does Madden, Madden football – is it programmed to do that without that game? Chaz – do you do you agree? No, of course it's not. If that didn't happen, it's not going to happen. It didn't ever happen. <laughs> well, it shouldn't have happened. Uh, here's what Al Davis said about it. Al Davis said, "quote It should have been called a fumble. That someone would reverse it without conclusive, indisputable evidence is just unbelievable." Right. So that well, was that was Al Davis's point. That of That brings view. up the ethical skeptic article over and over and over, even with these Hall of Fame snubs, and I just start to keep thinking like. Is really the whole league down on the Raiders that much? They're going to overturn a call because of that rule when there's not, you know, indisputable evidence. Uh, <clears throat> don't get me started. Uh, well, and we're going to talk. Uh, uh, by the way, guests today include Kenny King Jr. from Just Blog Baby, who's going to be with us after the first break, and we're going to talk about the Hall of Fame snubs. And that's where Al Davis. You remember when when we had the late great Cliff Branch on, who will be part of the conversation, of course, uh, with Kenny. When we had him on, he particularly gave us the reason why he thought he wasn't in the Hall of Fame. And we'll talk about that because yeah. it, it has to do with Al Davis. So uh, that's definitely the third big moment on January 19th in Las Vegas Raiders history now. Yeah. I know that at the time they were Oakland. 
But the, the commissioner said it's okay now to call them the Las Vegas Raiders, so they are the Las Vegas Raiders. Wait, that would be today then. Yes. Um, <laughs> AFC. Because it's history. the first January 19th they've been the Las Vegas Raiders. <laughs> Kelly, look at that. He's sharp. I thought Kelly was still sleeping. He's awake. No, he's good. Um, all right. AFC Championship game in 2000, January 19th, 2003, the last time the Raiders were in one. Mm-hmm. 41 to 24 over the Tennessee Titans. Yep. Despite. Despite the Raiders having 14 penalties for 127 yards, they tried 41 man, points with 127 the yards. They tried keeping them down. They did, but it goes back to the point we made a couple weeks ago, right? Is that going to be the thing now between you guys? Whenever the Raiders play a game and have more than one penalty, yep. that it's the NFL. Just I got kept... proof. Ethical skeptic proved everything. Well, uh, it's not going to be a thing I bring up all the time. It's now it's just reality, and whether or not they can get it corrected is up to the, up to the team. I mean, that's just base. Fans can claim all they want about it and say, "Well, it's true, it's true, it's true." And okay, so let's say it's true, but if it doesn't change and there's nothing done about it, then then it's reality. Right. So then. Raiders fan, the old adage, we have to beat the other team and the refs each game, then it's true, and you just know what you got to deal with, right? Mm-hmm. So you got to be extra careful and, and, and hope that it doesn't happen again. But anyway, so we have that. Also, guys, coming up uh, in the show today is Mick Akers, of course, our good friend here from the Las Vegas Review Journal. He's going to be with us because um, uh, Roger Goodell, as I mentioned, who said that it was now acceptable to call the Raiders the Las Vegas Raiders. Um, will be will be with us. He's going to update us on the NFL draft and what's happening there around Las Vegas and the the uh, the festivities that will occur and what will be happening here, where it's going to be. As I told people, and and no one believed us, but I and I can't divulge. Somebody wanted me to divulge who it was. Las Vegas locally, the Twitter handle. Um, we found out in London from a source with the NFL that the Bellagio Fountains thing was real, that it was going to happen, right? They had some challenges. Uh, No one believed us. No one believed it. We weren't the first one to report it. Actually, Mick found it in documents from the LVCVA because it's a public entity. So Mick will be on. He'll talk about that. But but clearly that was their first choice, and that's what they're going to do, in addition to other things. So we're going to talk to Mick about that, guys. We're also going to talk to him about the Allegiant Stadium, the Stadium Advisory Board meeting this week where they talked about the roof delay, which we talked about on Tuesday, Chaz, right. on Silver and Black tonight. Um, but also he'll get us up to date on other things like tailgating. Remember, remember guys, how everybody was so upset there was not going to be tailgating at Allegiant Stadium. Yeah. Well, we found out this week that there's going to be 7,000 dedicated tailgate spots, 5,000 of which within walking distance. Also, there's a front lot, which right now, if you go to Russell Road in Polaris, where the stadium is, you'll see a lot that's being used by employees. That lot, which will be expanded and made bigger, is going to be a tailgate area right there next to the stadium. Now, how much is going to cost? How many, how many people are going to be able to get there? Different story. But nonetheless, remember, 7,000 tailgate spots. The entire Oakland Coliseum had 10,000 parking spots total. Right. So um, from from that perspective, everybody's worried. I think now people can rest a little bit knowing that they're going to be able to tailgate the culture of tailgating, which is very important to Raiders fans, which is totally fine and great. Yeah. Uh, will not go away. Will it change? Yes. But it's going to be there. It's going to be a part, Chaz, of yeah. Raiderdom. No, it's big down there. You say 10,000 parking spots. I'd say three or 4,000 of those in, in the Oakland Alameda parking lot are dedicated to, solely to tailgating those that's just part of the part of the Raiders culture it's part of the game as far as I'm concerned we grew up in Southern California and that's what you did before the game you went down early and you tailgated and you got primed up for the game and it, I don't think that's going to change here no and you remember San Diego at at the old Jack Murphy Qualcomm whatever it's called mm-hmm. now San Diego County Credit Union there were 16,000 total parking spots right at that stadium huge yeah I mean you go in that parking lot it was massive right um with Allegiant Stadium, they will also have 16,000 parking spots. Are they all on site? Of course not, because the, the it's too small. Yeah. But they're all within. I've, I've gotten a lot of people fire back that, oh, it's, you have to walk. Dude, welcome to urban life. Like, if you go to Minneapolis, if you go to Chicago, if you go to Atlanta, you don't park right next to the stadium. You just don't. <laughs> not unless you give them that $20 handshake. <laughs> In that old Las Vegas handshake. No, but there's no parking lots. How, lo- like, how long's it been since you've tried to park at an NFL game? Um, you can't park like you. You couldn't park close to the stadium for twenty bucks when I had my Colt season tickets fifteen years ago. I accidentally drove right by the payment guy in Oakland at that last game against the Jaguars. Like, oh, was I supposed to pay that guy? And then just pulled right in and parked. So 
I was pretty close there, but I, shocker, Chaz. Did I, I meant to pay. <laughs> Sorry, Oakland. No, I, I meant to pay. <laughs> wow. Thought there was going to be another one somewhere. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> by the way, um, uh, the the internet gremlins here at CBS Sports Radio 1140 continue. So we are streaming live on video. Uh, it's been a little intermittent, so we'll get it. We'll get the the stream back up. So hang with us. Well, on let's that. get some callers in. I want to know what the callers think about George Bland. I mean uh, Tom Brady. Uh, yeah, Come unfortunately, in- we, our phones don't work yet because of our studio move, so yeah. we can't get callers. Okay, well, get them well, online there, and let's job, see what they Jazz. think about Tom Brady coming to the to the Raiders. I know there's such a big discussion about getting rid of Derek Carr. Do you want to bring in Tom Brady for, what, a year, two years? Uh, no. What are you going to squeeze out of but him? That's, I, I was going to say that, though. With, with the Tom Brady stuff, okay, so last night, of course, the, the fight that wasn't a fight, the 42nd spectacular UFC, Conor McGregor beats the Cowboy. I had a right. nickel for every time that happened. Yeah. Uh, he beats the Cowboy. He lasted 40 seconds mm-hmm. with the Cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> so so they, they, they go, they have the game, and, and of course, fight night in Las Vegas has always, always been a big deal, okay? So, so um, not, you know, especially now with UFC, boxing is not anywhere close to what it used to be. People don't show up for boxing like they used to show up. Uh, uh, it's just not the same anymore. But they do show up for... UFC. Uh, UFC, right? So, so last night we see everybody and their brother from Matthew McCona- McConaughey blah, blah, all right, all right. to yeah, exactly uh, to ice fishing in a Lincoln. I love that. Um, <laughs> to uh, Tom Brady, Baker Mayfield, looking like the commander of the jun- <laughs> yeah. Jungle Cruise boat, which was my favorite tweet. Um, so he's there, and of course he stops. He talks. He's talking. There's a picture taken of him talking to. Um, Mark, Davis. Mark Davis, the owner of the Raiders. Because Mark Davis, if you don't know, Mark Davis is now a, a fixture at all Las Vegas events, not just sporting events, yeah. but he's at charity events, all sorts of things, right? He has been. Over he, a year he's been hanging around here. He has. He sits at WNBA games, you name it, he's there. Yep. So he's there, and we get this picture of Tom Brady talking to him. And now Dana White says, hey, the, the Tom Brady, I'm good friends with him. Tom Brady to the Raiders. If he doesn't go back to the Patriots – him to the Raiders has legs to which I say BS because let me tell you something Mike Mayock in the story that and we're talk about this later that he had finally did an interview with Vic Tafer um, and he said look if we can get better at a position we'll get better at a position uh, but they can't get better at the position of quarterback with Tom Brady I don't care if he's the greatest of all time at this point in his career he's not better than Derek Carr sorry he's just not uh, I know the people who hate Derek Carl hate me for that. But anyway, mm-hmm. all right, we're going to talk about that in a little while. When we come back from this break, we're going to be joined by our good friend Kenny King Jr. Yes, he is the son of Kenny King from Oklahoma, former Raiders running back. Yeah. But he also writes at Just Blog Baby. And we're going to talk to him about the Hall of Shame. Cliff Branch, Tom Flores denied again. You're listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Welcome back to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Thanks for joining us on this conference championship Sunday. Chiefs versus the Titans and the Packers versus the 49ers. We'll get into those games later. What we want to do now, though, is we want to talk about just the word injustice when it comes to Raiders, when it comes to the Hall of Famers, I have now referred it to, uh, as many people do, the Hall of Shame. Of course, we know last week... The centennial class, Tom Flores, again shunned, as was Cliff Branch, the great wide receiver, speed kills for the Raiders, and just ridiculous. And um, we're going to go out now on the attorney, Michael Troiano, newsmaker line, and bring in our, our good friend, Kenny King Jr. Kenny writes for Just Blog Baby. If you haven't checked out the website, check it out. Great Raider content there, as always. Uh, Kenny, here we are, again, another year where we have to have an 83-year-old coach who deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, uh, who not only deserves it based on the numbers on the field, his performance as a coach, his performance as a player, but also his groundbreaking nature when it comes to diversity in the NFL, Hispanic quarterback, first Hispanic Latino coach in the NFL, first one to win a Super Bowl. And here we are, Kenny, again, saying he's not in. Yeah, you know what? It's it's an absolute travesty. I mean, you know, what we've seen um, throughout the throughout the history of the Hall of Fame, uh, and most notably 
uh, within the past couple decades. As we've seen these these coaches and players uh, that have been rightfully uh, that should be rightly rightfully deserving of a spot in the Hall of Fame get snubbed and only to be added after after their death. We saw it with Ken Stabler. We're we're now seeing the same thing happening with Tom Flores. We're seeing the same thing that happened with Cliff Branch, who's who passed last year and and who still isn't in. But I mean, you look at you look at Tom Flores' track record. You know, first Latino head coach, uh, first. First player, first player, assistant coach, head coach to win a Super Bowl. Uh, you know, the first Latino uh, to win a Super Bowl. There's so many things that go into it. Uh, so many things that, you know, that say he should be in that he's not. And then you look at some of the coaches that have been put in, um, you know, and I'm not trying to discredit Jimmy Johnson. I'm not trying to discredit Bill Cowher. Uh, but you look at Bill Cowher's stats compared to to Tom Flores' stats and, I mean, it's night and day. It is. And, Kenny, that's the thing. I, I, I don't understand it from the perspective of pure numbers because you look at the numbers, you compare Flores, again, three-time Super Bowl winner because a lot of times guys have great numbers and then they're, the, the big knock against them is, well, they didn't win a Super Bowl, right? Right. Uh, but uh, Tom Flores has three of them. Uh, and so, for me, I don't understand that. Then you switch – to, of course, uh, you know, one of the bigger injustices is someone who unfortunately left us um, late last year, and that was, of course, Cliff Branch. Cliff Branch, there's no justification to me, like zero, on why he's not in the Hall of Fame because of his numbers. And I want to say this. Look, you look at Cliff Branch, right? Cliff Branch, this, this pastime doesn't get in. All right, Cliff Branch, 501 receptions, 8,685 8, yards, 67 touchdowns, three Super Bowls, right? Postseason, 73 catches, almost 1,300 yards, five touchdowns. He averaged almost 18 yards a catch. Harold Carmichael, again, great player. I'm not taking anything away from him. Harold Carmichael, 590, 89, 85, 79 touchdowns. So a little more than Cliff, but basically the same basic um, uh, area, if you will, of excellence, except in the postseason, Carmichael had 465 yards, six touchdowns. Like That's it, right? So how can you compare those two guys, Kenny, and how can one be in and not the other? Well, absolutely. And you look at, you know, if you look at Cliff Branch's stats, right, you, you know, you, we touched on the postseason stats. And one of the things about his postseason stats, those stats stood as records up until 1993 when they were broken by Jerry Rice. Oh, that guy. So yeah. We're talk- <laughs> <laughs> so when we're talking about, you know, the players that the players that he's compared to. We've got guys like Jerry Rice, the greatest wide receiver of all time, who's in the Hall of Fame that that are in and you got guys like cliff branch who are who are snubbed year after year after year and you have to wonder you know you you have to wonder is there a raiders raiders bias and at some point you have to just connect all the dots and realize that there is definitely a raiders bias in the hall of fame when you have guys like cliff branch jim plunkett don mosbar dave dalby who are not in the hall and there are other players like harold carmark and i'm not going to take it away from them no then you know max speedy i mean come on even Lynn Swan, if you look at – okay, Lynn Swan may have some more Super Bowl rings, but if you look at Lynn Swan's stats compared to Cliff Branch's, Branch blows him out of the water. Even Lynn Swan's own teammate, Mel Blunt, said that Cliff Branch was one of the hardest receivers to cover. Right, and, and, and I'm glad you bring up Lynn Swan because that's one that I wrote down as well. And actually, when Cliff was in the studio here with us uh, back in 2018, he talked about that because if you look at Lynn Swan – Career numbers, 336 receptions to Cliff's 501. 5,462 yards to Cliff's 8,685. 51 touchdowns to Cliff's 67. He had one more Super Bowl ring, I got, I, like you said. That's true. And, and, Kenny, when I look at this, and, guys, you can jump in on this. When I look at this, Kenny, and, and what Cliff, and I, and I meant to cut the audio and bring it in, and I didn't today, and I'll, maybe I'll do it on Tuesday, but Cliff said to it, I asked him straight up, Cliff, what is this, what, why aren't you in the Hall of Fame? And he said to one name, he said Al Davis. He's like, they hold against me, Mr. Davis, and what he, what he was to the league back then, how he was looked as a maverick, how he made the league uh, pay for what he believed to be uh, misgivings. And so to me... That's the bias, and it's still there because I think a lot of these voters, Kenny, a lot of these older voters um, still have that bias against Al, even though he's been gone for eight, nine years. Absolutely. Absolutely. I talked to my dad about this, and, uh, you know, 
the the moment the moment that I saw that you know when I saw that Tom Flores wasn't getting in, and this was before Cliff, um, I, I sent him a text and I said, you know, I said I can't believe that once again Flores is snubbed, and my dad was like, they hate us, they hate the Raiders, they hate Raider Nation. And, you know, this is, you know, obviously as fans, we always say the NFL hates the Raider Nation, the NFL hates the Raiders, that there's a bias. When you have former players, uh, Super Bowl champions that are saying this, there's obviously, uh, there's obviously a bias in there. And there's obviously something that, you know, the league is still holding a grudge. You know, you look at, you look at our schedule and, <laughs> And how you know we've got one of the toughest road schedules. We're we're traveling you know more miles than anybody. We have a home game in in London. We've got home games in in Mexico. Mm-hmm. All these things are are indicators that you know the league is against us. But I hate doing the conspiracy theory. But it, there's so many glaring aspects of it that just make it so evident that it is. Yeah. Hey, Kenny, it's Chaz. Great article, man. I really enjoy your work. I got to tell you, uh, thank you. your dad was one of my favorite players when I was a kid growing up. I mean, how cool. He, he had a, a Super Bowl record. How cool is that, right? Yeah, yeah uh, it's pretty cool. I was, uh, I was a little bummed when Antonio Freeman broke it. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, Scott brought up Harold Carmichael. The Raiders beat the, the Eagles in that game. I mean, enough said right, right there. We, if Cliff Branch beat Harold Carmichael straight up in the Super Bowl, why is he in the Hall of Fame? And he, yeah, forget it. Well, let's just switch gears. Let's talk about what are your thoughts about the team moving forward? How do you see it progressing? Do you, do you like what uh, the pieces that are coming together now? And how do you see it moving forward coming to Las Vegas? Yeah, I'm excited about the team, you know, the team moving forward. I think that we have a lot of great pieces that we've added to it. Um, you know, I'm excited. I'm excited about the move. Uh, you know, obviously, as a, as a Raider fan from the Bay Area, um, it's it's sad to see your home team go, and it's sad to see you know uh, that we wouldn't that we weren't able to get something done in Oakland. Um, but you know what? I love Vegas. I've been to Vegas a t- tremendous amount of times in my life, um, and I absolutely love the city. I think that it's a great place. The Raiders, um, you know, Al Davis, that was one of his favorite places in the world. Uh, every year that he would have his birthday party there, uh, they yeah. would always do it big. Um, so I think that. You know, this is this is almost a tribute to Al. You know, this this stadium is is basically Al's mo- Al's white whale, where he he was never able to get it, and Mark was able to get this, and I think that that's that's huge. But you know, to think about the team, you know, we've got some great pieces here. We've got you know, we've got Josh Jacobs, who should be re- offensive rookie of the year. The kid's a stud. Uh, we've got a great young quarterback in Derek Carr. Um, he's a veteran leader. You know, he's he's getting better every year. Um, you know, obviously there's there's some knocks that, you know, that the the fans have on him, but, you know, you look at what he's done with what he has. And I think that he has done a tremendous job of, of navigating this team and and trying to put us in a position uh, to where we can succeed. Uh, We've got a solid young tight end in Darren Waller. He's a top three tight end. Uh, You know, Hunter Renfro is probably the best slot in the game. Uh, Max Crosby came out of nowhere. Uh, You know, there's a, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about this team. I think that they're trending in the right direction, you know, and, and, we have a lot of, you know, we've had a lot of the guys on, on the podcast, um, on our podcast, and we've we've got the same message from each each and every one of them. They all want to win. They all want to be Raiders. They all want to succeed. They're excited. It's a young team. It's something that we haven't had in a long time. You know, we've, we've been bringing in a lot of veterans, uh, you know, over 30 years old, coming in, making a bunch of money, and not doing a lot for us. And so now we're bringing in, you know, young guys, we've got the draft capital. Mike Mayock has done a tremendous job of drafting and bringing in undrafted free agents. Uh, it, there's a lot to be excited for for Raider Nation. There is. And, uh, Kenny, we we appreciate you being with us again. Kenny King Jr., you can catch him at Just Blog Baby as well. He's got a podcast link there, too. You can check it out. Uh, but uh, we appreciate you joining us on the Attorney Michael Troyano Newsmaker Line. And we'll get you on again real soon, my man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Kenny. All right. Kenny King Jr. there with uh, his take on the Hall of Shame and couldn't agree with him more. Just tragic, tragic. And hopefully maybe the move to Las Vegas. We didn't have time to talk to Kenny about it, but maybe the move to Las Vegas and the fact that the the league has so much riding on the relocation uh, and uh, them doing well here, that maybe that'll change things up. All right. We're going to step aside. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about last week's National Championship Games game and targets for the Raiders that we may have been watching Were there future Raiders in the game? Perhaps. We'll talk about it next on Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. The only 
way to take silver and black today with you is with the radio.com app. Download it today and search CBS Sports Radio 1140 in Las Vegas and listen to us anytime, anywhere. Welcome back to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Scott Cobranson, Chaz Osborne, and Kelly Kreiner with you today. I want to again thank Kenny King Jr. for joining us uh, before the break to talk about just the ridiculousness of the Hall of Fame snubs, the continued snubs of Raiders coach Tom Flores and, of course, wide receiver Cliff Branch. And, guys, I, I mean, I just don't I – mean, there's just not – I haven't heard anybody respond with any kind of – now, with Flores, I do see some people arguing that his record wasn't good enough, which I disagree, but at least they have something that they can point to to try to make an argument, even if I don't agree with it. But with Cliff Branch especially, I mean, I, I, I think both of them should be in, no doubt. But I think with Cliff Branch in particular, how can you ever argue against him being there? Well, it's the, the wide receiving or the wide receivers that get in the Hall of Fame. It's always been kind of a weird thing because you look at some of the guys that take a while to get in. And then you look at a guy like Drew Pearson, who's not in. When you look at his like his raw numbers, you don't really think about it. But then you realize he's the only member of the all decade 70s offense to not be in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> it's kind of a weird distinction when and everyone else that's on the all 70s team. Right. Is in the is Hall there. of Fame. And but the video of him was heartbreaking yeah. to watch him because he really thought he was going to be in. And it sounded like he, he, he claims that somebody told him he was going to be in. Oh, really? And you probably and unfortunately, I'm sure stuff like that happens to these guys all the time. Yeah. You've got somebody that's going to. Oh, man, this is your. The, it's just you, you that you run into yeah. stuff like that. Unfortunately, the big thing with me with Coach Flores that I just don't understand because it just seems like you know the NFL will sell their soul for good PR or money. We've seen that a thousand <laughs> times. If they can make a nickel or they can come out looking good, they will bend over backwards and do anything. Just the PR of saying you've got the first Latino head coach, right. the first Latino quarterback. Just the PR spin to have on that to show your diversity, as I do air quotes on a radio show. Yeah, but that was going to be my point. A large portion of the the Raider fans are Latino, and to have that, and that's you know that's that's a real nice that's a milestone for Tom Flores. We all know Tom Flores was an exceptional head coach, and then we can go on with with, um, Plunkett. You know, Plunkett stayed diligent, and, and he made the most of his second chance. And Cliff Branch. He revolutionized the wide receiver position. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. And they're all better people off the field. You know, seeing them at training camp this last year, you know, taking pictures with the fans, signing autographs, just interacting with everybody. Um, I don't need a selection committee to tell me how exceptional these guys were, you know, during their time with the Raiders. Uh, my memory of them walking off the field after winning Super Bowls, you know, that tells me that right there. So, you know, it, for me, we're Raider fans. We already know. I, I've, I've been to Canton, you know, and I've been to the Hall of Fame. It's really cool, you know. The Raiders basically have their own wing in Canton, you know. That's how many players they already have in there. Um, but Raider fans know that Jim Plunkett and Cliff Branch and Tom Flores um, deserve to be there. And, you know, for us being fans, in our minds, they're already great people. They're already great players, coaches, all the above. So we don't need that. But, uh, you know, you made up a great point in the last um – the guy was just a nightmare to cover. He said it verbally. The miss says no, but well, no. I'm I'm just a person that two years ago they were trying to do everything they could to separate their league from Las Vegas. Yeah. So it's not like they're listen. Well, let, then why are they bringing let, the draft here? Why are they showcasing the city? Well, yeah, but see here. Well, no, because they just got a two billion dollar stadium. Mm-hmm. That's the whole thing. <laughs> it's like they got a city to pony up seven hundred fifty million dollars and to take a historic franchise and get them out of that crap box they were playing in Oakland Ooh. and put them in a new city. Mm-hmm. But let's not act like they're not super the, – they're they're out here. Like, we saw Goodell the other day, and he's in town. He's he Oh, it's the Las Vegas Raiders. He's not super excited about this. He just understands it was going to happen. Right. I don't see him being super excited about anything, to be honest with you. But maybe they get some restitution. They get a fresh start, a fresh city, and then the league finally says, all right, let's – Let's give the Raiders what they deserve here and uh, stop calling penalties on every other play. Well, <laughs> certainly, certainly, I mean, you're, you're right. And, and will it change? I, I, I actually see points in both your sides here where Kelly's saying, look, 
yeah, reluctantly they're here because it's a big market. There's big money opportunities. Um, but I do think they want it to succeed. That doesn't mean that team has to succeed and win the Super Bowl or they, they, they change their point of view on being anti-Raider when it comes to the Hall of Fame. Uh, but because they want the team to succeed here, especially financially, because then everybody benefits from it. That's right. Yeah, I mean, but it's the NFL. It's going to succeed anywhere you put it. Yeah. Point. Mostly. No, actually, where hasn't it succeeded? Well, no, even, I was gonna, I was even gonna, in Jacksonville I was, when I was, they were and bad, I, and it, I was getting ready well. to say Jacksonville's like it, Cincinnati. You know, I don't mean to dump on the the Cincinnati people back home, but that's all. <laughs> that's always been one of those lower tier franchises. Guess what? It makes money every year. Mm-hmm. Yes, it does. It does, and and that's the thing. I mean, I. With, with this situation with Branson Flores, it, this was the year like I and, you know, I, it's personal to me because when I worked, I worked with uh, Jerry Tarkanian's family when he was getting older and sick. Um, I worked with his daughter, uh, Jody, on the campaign to get him in the Basketball Hall of Fame. I did some digital work for them to help them raise awareness of that. And luckily, Coach Tarkanian, he was in a wheelchair at that time was able to go and get inducted into the Naismith Hall of Fame. So it meant very much. And I think what people forget is it's not about Raider fans. Forget the fans. Sorry, it's true. Forget the fans. It's not about the fans. It's about the player. And if the player is gone, unfortunately, like Cliff, it's about their family. It's about making sure the family recognizes and can celebrate their loved one who's either no longer with us or is still with us in the case of Coach Flores. It's about recognizing their contribution to the game and, and, and what it means to the game. Uh, and I think that's where it really hurts because the, both those men did so much for the National Football League and so much for, for the sport. And in Tom Flores' case, so much for Latinos. You talk to Latinos from Fresno, where he's from, mm-hmm. and they tell you there's murals of Coach Flores. They, they tell you what it meant for to see one of their own go and become some, so much of a success. And I think that's where the NFL shats on these people. I mean, they just do. They, 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 they're not looking at the overall recognition and, and contribution of the coach to the game. Yeah, and Jim Plunkett as well. I don't even know why his name's not in there. But, I, you know, I already said, I don't need a committee to tell me these guys are exceptional players, coaches, and people off the field. So, so no, it. but again, their families should though. It's it's important for their families. Yeah, it so, really is. the The Plunkett one, I mean, I you can you can do a little more of a um, breakdown on why he's not in there. I mean, it it like like we're saying with Branch, there's no reason. Yeah, Plunkett, you can kind of come. I mean, you can see both sides of that argument a little bit. Super Bowl yeah. MVP, two Super Bowl championships. Tom Flores, does he get those without Plunkett? So are we still talking about Tom Flores in the same light if Plunkett doesn't win him those two Super Bowls? Well, but Flores isn't in, so that kind of backs up the argument why Plunkett would right on there as well. Yeah. Now that's the thing if if you know if Flores was already in there, that the Plunkett argument that would help out right. the Plunkett argument as mm-hmm. well. But that's the other thing I'm saying. You know, that's another thing against kind of both of them. Neither one of them and, are in there. And, and I think I think Plunkett. There's a case for Plunkett, no doubt. Um, and I think that you know when you look at this is if you look at the differences between the three men, it's not always just about accomplishments, too. It's about the totality of their career and what they did. Correct. And On and off the field. Correct. And I think that off the field stuff doesn't matter. I know that's yeah. the NFL, but will tell obviously you that it does because they've got two guys that are on TV and it's a popularity contest. So doing something off the field matters if you're going to. OJ Simpson's still in the Hall of Fame. Well, he was already in there. <laughs> well, but but you're right about the TV thing, though. I will say that that does play into it because look, uh, Jimmy Johnson does he deserve to be a Hall of Fame coach? Probably. Yeah. Does Bill Cowher? Probably as well. I, I don't have a problem with them being in. Mm-hmm. I have a problem with who's omitted. And to me, when you look at Coach Flores compared to those men, there's there, there's no there's no reason why. Right, right the there fact, and I just thought, I know some people thought it was great, and they can disagree with me all they want. I don't care. It's their opinion. The, the way in which they unveiled it to those two men was unfair as well. OK, by the head of the Hall of Fame, who now we find out I didn't know this until uh, Kendra um, Stabler Moore, who is the uh, daughter of, of, of Ken Stabler, talked about how this man was convicted of forty eight thousand dollars for forgery. And he told the Stabler family when they were there, besides the fact that they couldn't get his jacket and ring, which is another whole story together, um, that the, the, they, they sold out of Stabler merchandise. And the Hall of Fame told the Stabler family the families get a cut of that money and they never got a cent. Yeah. So here you are lying upon lying, and then the guy's gone, so you can't get his jacket and his ring? Hmm. I mean, are you kidding me? 
what could be the justification for that? Because because they're dead and you were idiots and didn't put them in the Hall of Fame before they passed away, you're going to deny their family the jacket and the ring? F you. Yeah. I mean, really. What a great guy, too. I got I got a chance to meet Stabler. Just such a soft-spoken. He'll talk to anybody, anytime. Just a, a, Same with all these other guys, Plunkett and Flores. Just a really nice guy. And for him to have to go through that in the family, like you said, to celebrate the families, they, they all deserve those accolades, and they deserve to have that celebration. And, uh, you know, the more you find out about the league, and, and uh, Kelly talks about it all the time, it, it's a fun – it's – it's entertainment, you know, sports is entertainment. It's not it's not life and they should be treating these guys a little bit better. But this just comes off as petty. That's all that does. That yep. the jacket and the ring thing. It I mean every, it's a jacket and a ring. It's not like, you know, yeah. if they do the thing to where like if they've passed with the um like the speech and everything from family members, that's something I can kind of get into because you're getting into a whole different dynamic there. Right. But it's just a jacket and a ring. You're already making these for these other people. <laughs> it's just a bull bleep petty move. Yeah. But the worst was the Stabler thing with the family money for selling the merchandise. Right. It was crazy. That when I oh. when I read that, I'm like, holy. I mean that. Yes. That, that like and that's coming from the family. It's not it, like somebody's rumor. It's that's not a rumor. That's that's actually well, no. But it, it's the fact that. When I the first second I read it, I never for one second doubted it, because if there's one group that would do something like that to me, it's the NFL. <laughs> all right. Well, listen, we're going to great discussion, guys. Um, and I think we're all in agreement. We're going to step aside when we come back and be joined by Mick Akers of the Las Vegas Review Journal. He'll get us up to date on where the NFL draft will be in Las Vegas. Get ready for some closings of streets, ladies and gentlemen. You're listening to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. In Las Vegas, Nevada, home of the Las Vegas Raiders, officially. Uh, welcome back, and we appreciate you being with us. Uh, don't forget, this show, when it's over, uh, we upload it. You can catch it at iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Android, uh, the Google Play Store, wherever you get your podcast. You can also download the archive version of this as well. Uh, we're also live on video most of the time. We've had some issues again today. We apologize for that. Uh, we don't control the internet connection into the station, so when it goes a little wacky, um, it just goes a little wacky, but we always try to get it more stable, so we're up there live again right now if you want to watch us and come in the studio. All right, we're going now again on the attorney Michael Troiano newsmaker line and bringing in uh, a great, great reporter here in town, covers the Raiders issue, especially around the stadium and all things transportation in the area, and that, of course, is Mick Akers. Uh, and Mick, this week, lots happening in, in Raiderdom when you look at uh, Las Vegas and the relocation, the stadium construction, and of course, coming up here in April, not too far away, is the NFL Draft. And uh, you wrote a story about the draft and how it would close the Las Vegas Strip for three days. What's the latest, um, uh, Mick, on the draft and where it will be held here in Las Vegas? Yeah, so um, latest is they've been trying to get the stage over the Bellagio for a while. So it looks like the dream scenario that they've been you know, <laughs> picking at for a while is going to come true here. They're supposed to – NFL, the Raiders are supposed to be at the – County Commission meeting on Tuesday to uh, kind of present their plan there. And um, so it looks like they have the stage over the Bellagio. That's the main focal point is what I was told by the source. And then the Caesars Forum, the new um, convention center they're building that opens up next in uh, March, uh, is going to be like a secondary site. So they, you know, they weren't exactly sure on specifics. So I was trying to see, hey, maybe is it day one they're going to be at Bellagio and then the rest of the, you know, two days they're going to be at Caesars Forum. They said that you know it could be likely, but they they didn't want to, they didn't want to confirm that with me. So you know I, I went with you know focal points are hey, Bellagio, Caesar's Forum, and then the fan experience is supposed to be somewhere around Flamingo and Koval by the West End there. I think maybe that that road lead, leading up to the Caesar's Forum and you know the link and all that. I think it might be the the site where like the the fan area is going to be with the the, the draft town and all that. Yeah, Mick, I know I know you and I were hearing and we talked to several months ago about it uh, after our trip to London. I mentioned earlier, we had talked to some folks with the NFL who who had kind of confirmed that the desire for the Bellagio fountains, they were having an issue with actually fiber and getting Internet out there, obviously, for broadcasts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it sounds like they might have some way to do that. And then, of course, as you talked about that fan area, I mean, it sort of sounds like 
Flamingo and the strip obviously be closed and then maybe Flamingo all the way down past Koval so that they can have all that fan experience area. And and I, it's funny to me, though, because I see I understand if you're not a football fan, you're not a football fan. There are people out there who don't like football. I get it. I'm cool with it. But when you talk about this closure, I know it would be unprecedented for the area because we do it on New Year's Eve. We do it for marathons. We do it all that kind of stuff. But to do it for three days that we know of, but then the prep time before that might require them to close it even longer. I get the inconvenience part of it. But Mick, this is a huge, huge commercial for for tourism and, and gaming and everything for Las Vegas. And not only that, but the financial impact is massive, is it not? Yeah, so there, you know, they meant, they mentioned about four hundred thousand people expected. I know Nashville, I think they had six hundred thousand. So I'm not sure where the where that drop comes from, but that, I was told four hundred thousand. But obviously, three days closing the strip down, you know, basically from Harmon to Spring Mountain, you know, pretty big closure. All that there are talks about maybe doing some reopenings overnight. You know, maybe just a couple lanes. I know they're going to close it down at least for two weeks on in front of the Bellagio down the two lanes on the strip. So, you know, pretty big impact, but, you know, we have this many people coming for this many days, you know, it's, it's they're going to kind of deal with it. I think uh, they said it's, you know, going to be the largest closure of the strip ever, but, you know, with so many people coming to town, you know, I think, you know, obviously the rooms are going to be filled up. People are going to be, you know, eating, drinking, having a good time, you know, all these three days, maybe in a couple of days before that and after it. So, uh, you know, they're just looking at this as a big, you know, financial impact there for Vegas. Again, we're talking to Mick Akers, a reporter for the Las Vegas Review-Journal, on our attorney Michael Troiano newsmaker line about the draft uh, coming to Las Vegas. We appreciate that update, Mick. Make sure you read. He just did a story um, a few days ago on this, um, and so check that out on the Review-Journal. Also, Mick, you were at the, um, the stadium board meeting this week where they talked about the delay that we've talked about with your colleague Rick Vallada on Tuesday, and we've written about on our website as well. Um, that delay, it appears as though they, they were, they, they're okay with it now. They have it all back in motion, and we even heard over the last 24 hours that they might even start working back Back on raising that roof what's the latest on that and and kind of what's the mi- mi- biggest misconception about this roof quote-unquote delay well the, the biggest one obviously is everyone thinks it's going to push back that july 31 date you know that i don't know for some reason there's this large group of people who want this thing to fail it seems like so they everyone can like you know find and point out every reason they can and say hey this is not going to open on time but you know, Don Webb mentioned, you know, Mortensen been building these, you know, sports facilities, you know, for decades here, and they've never missed a deadline. And he mentioned this won't be the first one they fail on. So, you know, that July 31st day is like the big, the big, you know, talking point about it, obviously. So this, the roof issue that looks like, you know, they're, you know, they're kind of going full bore at it. They're adding another crane, um, adding six day shifts, to, you know, address to what they're doing here with the ETFE once they get that uh, cable that, you mentioned a handful of bolts out of about half a million, you know, that had an issue. So obviously not a big deal. Mentioned the weather that, hey, if we have some rain, maybe that can happen. But he, he called out December being a pretty wet weather, making, the, you know, 200% more rain than usual. And he said they had about $100,000 in damage, which is, you know, $2 billion project with, you know, dropping the bucket there. So, you know, just the people that want to, see this thing not go off first plan is you know i don't know why but they, you know <laughs> anything they can grab a hold on they're gonna jump on so there's conspiracy theorists people out there that you know they'll get anything they can just you know they can put this thing down sure I don't know. Well, <laughs> they make a lot of accusations with, with us so, oh yeah uh, it's, it's i know weird on the end but you know uh we report what we get and we don't you know jump on the rumor train so so far so good looks like Oh yeah, there's there's what they have to do. There's lots, lo- Mick. There's lots of agendas out there, and and as people who report on the news or talk about it like we do on the radio, uh, you become targets of that. We got about thirty seconds left with you, though. One of the other things I talked about earlier in the show uh, that also we gleaned from your reporting this week was the fact that there will be seven thousand tailgate spots for this stadium. Talk a little bit about that and how maybe Raider fans can finally rest that they're going to be able to tailgate. Yeah, so that, you know. Madane mentioned, you know, there's in Oakland there's about 2,000 tailgating spots. Uh, here in Vegas, it's going to be 7,000. Obviously, not all on site, but you know, there's about 5,000 within walking distance. Obviously, the stadium districts they're going to start developing that pretty soon. So, you know, 
plenty of parking areas, walking the distance, um, tailgating. They very, he was very adamant saying, hey, we are encouraging tailgating because a lot of people, the rumor mill obviously came out, hey, no tailgating. So um, latest rendering came out on site. You know, some of these spots are on site um, tailgating. So, you know, people that have those, obviously, I'm not going to be, you know, cutting people off. They're going to come in and people have a good time. So, obviously, once you have your fun and you're walking distance spot, you get to the stadium, there'll be more tailgating spots there. A couple of activation sites, the field tray area is going to have, you know, some tailgating S aspects to it. So, you know, there's going to be no lack of pregame and postgame activities there in the stadium. There will not be. And Mick, we appreciate, as always, your reporting and, and thanks for being with us at Mick Akers, M-I-C-K-A-K-E-R-S. Mick, we'll talk to you next time, man. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. There's Mick Akers with all you need to know about the draft, the stadium, tailgating, all of it. When we come back, we're going to roll on with hour number two. We're going to talk about the college national championship game. Did we see some Raider future Raiders in it? Also, we'll talk NFC, AFC championship game, Kelly's Corner, and more just ahead. You're listening to Las Vegas' only all Raiders talk show. That is the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Your Raiders covered. Knock on wood if you're with me. It's Silver and Black today on CBS Sports Radio 1140. And now, here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Welcome back to hour number two of the Silver and Black today here on January 19th, 2020, as we get set for the AFC-NFC Championship game. Of course, the Chiefs hosting the Titans and... The 49ers hosting the Packers. Before we talk about those games, because being football fans and, and covering football, of course, we got to talk about those games. It's the, the, the precursor to the Super Bowl. We want to talk a little bit about last Saturday's, or Monday's game, I should say, the national championship game, college football's national championship game. Of course, LSU uh, runs away with the title against Clemson. But did we see some future Raiders in that game and so uh this will this segment will have a lot to do with our our draft expert kelly kreiner uh but guys you look at that game first of all it was a great game first half obviously a little closer and then lsu pulled away um in the second half and and a lot of people i think you know read into some of these players who are going to either come out in the draft this year or next year uh and wanted to judge them based on that one performance trevor lawrence um, and, uh, you know, it, it's funny how people overreact to that. But if we look at both Clemson and LSU, and I'll start with you on this, Kelly, um, when you look at those two teams and you look at the needs that the Raiders have, who on that field on Monday was perhaps maybe a guy the Raiders can grab at 12 or 19 uh, that you think uh, might be a good fit and might be in play for Las Vegas at numbers 12 and 19? Well, the big one all the Raiders fans and everybody was just kind of really hoping for is Simmons from Clemson. I don't see any way south of him having some kind of medical or personal red flag at the combine. He falls to 12. He's just too good. I mean, if you look at, like, he's he won the, he won the award for the best linebacker in football, yet he played corner and safety more than he did linebacker, and he played it extremely well. That just shows how athletic he is. Yeah, he's a <laughs> – he can play all over the field. I think he's definitely going to be gone by 12. Uh, well, Kelly, Kelly, before you move on from Simmons, because because I, I, I understand what you're saying. I think I think he is such a special player that for him to be there available at 12 seems like a bit of a long shot, but crazy stuff happens. And 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 you're right about him. I mean, I, I'm amazed by this kid's talent. First of all, he's from Kansas, Olathe, Kansas, right where I used to next to live. You live in and, Overland Park. And I heard a great story Monday night from somebody who – has some dealings with the University of Arkansas. He was going to go to Arkansas, and Brett Bielema was like, "Ah, we don't need him. Oh, <laughs> we don't have a." The, well, I, I believe the exact quote. Spot for him. I believe the exact quote was, "We don't have a spot for you." Oh yeah. my gosh! But you're right about him. When you look at him, he is everything. And and to me, I think he's going to either go to New York or to Detroit. Is most likely where he's going to go because they need that help. But if you look at him, you're right. Forty percent of his snaps were at slot corner, twenty six at safety percent. 20% at outside linebacker, 11 and a half inside linebacker, and 2% at boundary cornerback. 
This guy, for a quarterback, an opposing quarterback, when he lines up, you have no idea what's going to happen. Right. Is he a perfect fit for the Paul Gunther system? <laughs> no, because Paul Gunther's system doesn't prioritize <laughs> linebackers. It's a shame. Well, he's everything, though. He's not just a linebacker. That's what's amazing yeah. about this kid, and I think that's why Raider fans are so excited about him. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, but yeah, um, that's the thing. It's funny. It's hard to watch film on him because you don't know where he's lining up. Yes. But it's easy to pick him out once the play starts because he's the dude that's flying around everywhere. Yeah. Like, he makes himself known. And you mentioned it, like, should be an easy pick. Th this draft, the first four picks should already be finished. It should be Burrow, Young, Akuda, and Simmons. Yes. But when you get to three and four, the Lions will never draft a cornerback in the first round. They have it since Terry Fair in the 80s, or I mean in the 90s. And then I think uh, maybe was Carl Banks the last linebacker that the, the Giants. Giants have drafted in the first round in the 80s? Like but, the, but when you look at the him, Giant, though, the Giants don't take linebacker. The well, Lions don't take corner. Yet they're the best players at the biggest position in need. Right. But if you look at look at Simmons, the thing the thing with him is that he plays all over the place. So yeah, but, he, he's. But I think in the NFL, he's mostly going to be a linebacker who can fall back into coverage. Right. Well, that's the thing. You're playing him at linebacker in the NFL. Right. You might I mean you could play him at safety every once. For, like because they showed him playing single high safety on a couple things. You can do that in college. But you're not doing that in the pros, right? You know, the the slot the, the slot receiver at Vanderbilt's a little different than the slot receiver at Tennessee. <laughs> you know, so it's like we need to calm down a little bit on him being all over the place, like playing boundary corner and everything. He will be on the he will be a linebacker. Now you can play him middle, you can play him say I mean you can play him Sam anywhere, right? But yeah, that's going to be you know he's going to be the linebacker. The name you're seeing pop up a lot right now. And it's uh, Patrick Queen, the linebacker from LSU, because I don't know if you guys know this, uh, the Raiders need linebackers. Just a little I, bit. I saw something on Twitter yesterday that said this linebacking core was the first one since 2000 to not have a sack, fumble recovery, or fumble forced from their linebacking core all season. Yeah, the Raiders, yeah. How is that possible? You when don't you're bad. You don't accidentally... <laughs> run into a fumble mm -hmm. force or recovery from a linebacker. Right. But, yeah, Patrick Queen, I mean, he can fly everywhere. You watch the tape. He's sideline to sideline. He is just fast. But then you realize he's 6'1", 220. You yeah. know, people are saying Isaiah Simmons is a tweener, not big enough to play linebacker. He's 6'4", 230. I, I was shocked, Chaz, too, to watch the game the other night and to see, because obviously you got a lot of Raider folks on my Twitter feed, mm -hmm. people, fans, and others that are Raider fans watching the game and talking about how Simmons wasn't that great. I was thinking to myself, are you not watching the same game I am? Yeah, I know, right? They're but not watching it from the same perspective. Seven tackles? You know, it's hard uh, uh, just when you're watching the game, just following the camera. You don't really see what happens off the camera, right? And like it's like I said earlier, he's hard to track because you don't know where he's lining mm -hmm. up. Because li normally you normally you can just kind of focus in on, you know, hey, the middle linebacker or mm -hmm. the quarterback or the right. defensive end. But they move him around so much he does everything. If you think he had a bad game in the national championship game, you should quit watching football. Yeah. Like <laughs> if seven tackles is a bad game. Well, no, I don't I'll I don't care him. what his numbers are because his impact is so much bigger because of like you said, you're putting him everywhere. Right. And you, the things you don't see, you know, when the camera follows the quarterback, yeah. you don't see him back there in coverage shutting people down, you know, because that just follows the ball. Yeah, and it's it's funny, man, but the tra yeah, the Trevor Lawrence hate went crazy. He had a bad game. Yep. He was and that's like you'll see that in the NFL, you'll see it in every sport. He was he's just a little high on everything. Yep. And Let's be honest. If the officials don't blow that pass interference call, Ugh. this game's totally different. Like, game. It's a different game. It totally yeah. is. And he had a terrible game, and they still had a chance. Well, to and make and, and that's what that's that's where I think the, the social media stuff and our connecting this so so tight all the time ruins things a little bit because somebody has a bad, the same thing we talked about Lamar Jackson last week, right? Had a bad game, you know, 500 yards of offense. Mm -hmm. Yes, he had some decision making that was great. It was his first real playoff game and he hasn't won one one yet as a starter, but but so what? I don't I, I I'm amazed how today they watch a player one time. Yep. That one player, despite 99.9% .9 of the time being an amazing player, has that 0.1% where they don't have the best game and suddenly they're not worthy. It's that what have you done for me lately yeah. kind of mentality. It's just that snap <laughs> response where everybody it is. can, you know. Uh, one other guy I just want to kind of highlight in that Clemson game is T. Higgins, the wide receiver, because yes. I've seen him at 19 a lot. 
I'm not as big a fan of him as a lot of other draft people. I just think he's going to have a little trouble getting separation in the pros. Yeah. Now he's going to be that guy that you know he's good at contested catches. He can kind of box you out. But with what this Raider team is lacking is like that. To me, it's the speed element, no. the guy that can separate. Yeah. So he's not exactly. Yeah, you know, would be my first choice. Did he have that penalty on that blindside block? Was that him? I, I can't remember who had it, but let's yeah. be honest, the blindside block thing needs to go. Yeah, he, well, he hit him on <laughs> um, the side. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't that bad. They ended, well, he eventually it, scored that, a touchdown it, on that drive anyway. It, that was not a blindside block penalty. No. He was in front of him. That was a clean block. Yep. Um, it's like, I hate the thing. Oh, d- he's a defensive. He didn't see it coming. It's not your fault. It's not the defender's or the guy blocking's fault that the guy that gets blocked's not doing his job correctly. Yeah. Well, there's <laughs> safety know? issues, but they end up scoring a touchdown on that drive anyway. But just, you know, as far as T. Higgins is concerned, maybe you, you look at those kind of plays and think he's not the highest IQ player. I don't know. That, well, no, that's just he, a small sample it, size. That, and like I said, it was a blown call. He, I think that so. Was a, it was a clean hit. I think so. You know, that, and I don't, I don't need my players to be the smartest people out there. No, but you talk about T. Higgins. Um, and inability to separate is is that so that's a guy you're not going to want to take at 19 that's a guy that maybe he's a low first rounder second rounder because is is he still a, a wide receiver one in the nfl kelly uh i mean yeah it depends, depends on, on the team i was gonna say it kind of depends on your system but he's a guy that could de- definitely develop into a top flight you know that kind of number one guy um I'm trying to think of a comp form off the top of my head, and Allen Robinson kind of keeps popping into my head, but that's just a tough one because he's stuck in Chicago, and we've if if Allen Robinson was <laughs> on a if, no seriously if Chicago yeah. had a decent quarterback, man, and more people would be talking about how good Allen Robinson is. Right. Well, with that though, you you talked about um, and some of the guys that I think Raider fans really want at wide receiver either at 12 or 19 will be gone, but who realistically would be there that you would take ahead of T. Higgins? There's three that that have a shot to fall to the Raiders at 12. Um, Judy's the long, Jerry Judy from Alabama is kind of the longer shot, in my opinion. Uh, C.D. Lamb is the one, you, the big name you see a lot with yes, the Raiders. Yes, uh, A lot of teams will have C.D. Lamb one over Judy, so it just kind of depends on which team, which philosophy, which ones are going to like. Um, and then Henry Ruggs is the, pretty much, those are kind of the top three on everybody's draft board. Uh, you'll see LSU's Jefferson, who was in the game. You know mm-hmm. he's going to start creeping up some boards. Um, I saw PFF had a draft where, and this guy wasn't at twelve or nineteen, but he was in the late twenties. It's a wide receiver from Tennessee. I'm spacing on his name, but I was kind of confused, so I went back and watched a couple Tennessee games. If you're looking for a wide receiver who's not fast, can't catch, and doesn't run very many routes, <laughs> this is your kid. That's I was blown away. God, I was blown away when I saw that. That's, oh, a, that's, that's a Kelly assessment. I know, I know that's one. a tangent right there, but I, I, that just popped into my head. But, but that, no, yeah, um, Jet, like I said, Jefferson's going to make – He's to me, he's a late one, early two kind of guy. But I think if the Raiders do go at 12, it's going to be one of that trio of Ruggs, Lamb, or Judy. And I think Judy would be – like if he somehow falls to 12 – you have to run you up as quick him. as you can. Yeah, He's the best route runner I've ever seen in college football. Amazing. All right. Well, that was a little bit on the national championship game, possible Raiders and guys that we're going to be talking a lot about over the next few months as we lead up to the NFL draft here in Las Vegas. We're going to step aside and pay some bills. When we come back, we're going to talk AFC-NFC championship game, what to expect. Kelly thinks the picks are pretty easy on this one. We're not going to pick later in the show, but we're going to talk about the games When we come back, you're listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. How are you doing? This is Charlie Garner, and you're listening to Silver and Black today. Stay tuned. All right, welcome back to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140 from Las Vegas, home of the NFL's Las Vegas Raiders. I'm Scott Cobranson, joined by Chaz Osborne and Kelly Kreiner. We're going to talk now about the big games today, guys. AFC, NFC Championship game, of course. The Chiefs hosting in Arrowhead the Titans, the amazing Titans. Two winners of two in a row, obviously, beating the former Super Bowl champions, the the the. Patriots, last year's Super Bowl champions, then going to Baltimore and beating the number one seed in the AFC in the playoffs. And now they go to Kansas City to face the Chiefs. Uh, Andy Reid, I mean, I think this is one of the things, and I know I know Raider fans, I know how they feel about the Chiefs, guys. 
But <laughs> look at Andy Reid. I mean, Andy Reid to me is is definitely the best coach that hasn't won a Super Bowl. Look, consider sixty one percent winning percentage. Fifteen of his twenty one seasons, he's gone to the playoffs. It's incredible. Okay. I think the his second most uh, AFC Championship games right behind. Correct. Seventy one percent. He's had ten or more wins in a season. Okay. The only thing is, in the playoffs, not so good. So, uh, if Andy Reid wins today, goes to the Super Bowl, and wins the Super Bowl, is he is he up there? I mean, Bill Belichick's won six Super Bowls. You can't touch that. Right. Just you can't. But is he then up there? Is he up towards the top? If not on Mount Rushmore of pro football coaches, is he close? Well, you're going way back from Mount Rushmore. Uh, I was gonna, I, see, yeah, the Mount. I was not expecting Mount Rushmore. Yeah. Not in to me. There's like because when I hear Mount Rushmore, I think of the top four. Right. And Tom Flores. To me, I, I don't uh, care uh, what Danny Reed does. He will never be in my Mount Rushmore of coaching. I just and I, like I said, that's just because when I think of that, it's like. And it's like the argument with the Hall of Fames and stuff. When you say the name, you should say yes or no. You should already think yeah, that you already in your head. Mm -hmm. So when you said Andy Reid on Mount Rushmore, I like pause because I did. I never thought I would hear those two things <laughs> in the same sentence today. He's a he's a great coach, but I don't think he can do anything to where I ever think him as one of the best ever. Even though I mean he's got an amazing resume, but it just that's not what comes to my head when I think of Andy Reid. Right. But but is that only because of the lack of titles? Well, that's part of it, but I mean, it's it's also when I think of the Mount Rushmore of coaching, I'm thinking, like you thinking said, you guys Lombard, yeah, Lombardi, Lombardi, Belichick. I mean, I'm thinking George of Hallis. those guys. Yeah, seventy one percent of his seasons, twenty one seasons, ten wins or more. Pretty freaking remarkable. No, that's think what I'm, that's what I'm saying. He's got a great resume, but I just. That's not like when you, because like I said, for me, when I think of Andy Reid, I think of betting on him after a buy and it gets him in the playoffs. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's the first thing right. that pops into my head because you give him a week to prepare, he's going to destroy you. Yep. But he, when he gets in the playoffs, he, you know, the same okay. Mar Marty Schottenheimer is kind of the same thing. He Marty Schottenheimer is incredible during the regular, <laughs> regular season, season game and playoffs. Playoffs, well, there you go. Yeah. Right. Although Marty, I, I don't think Marty's record is near as as dignified as Andy right. Reid's. But we look at the game today, guys. Chiefs, Titans, the Titans, I made this point to Kelly uh, before you got here this morning, Chaz, that to me, I don't think the Titans have a chance. I just don't, but you never know. Everybody's got a little bit of a chance, Perfect. Right? You got a little bit of a chance. So, so <laughs> Hedging my Chiefs <laughs> Super Bowl as we speak. Thanks, Scott. That's fine. Yeah, I told you 50 in. points last week. Did they score 50 points, the Chiefs? I don't know. No, yes, they're 51. They that's right. So they, ah, they, yeah, That's right. I, but I said 50. So, anyway, Chiefs um, against the Titans. If the Titans... Tell me if I'm wrong on this. If the Titans win this game, if they go in and upset the Chiefs at home, the Chiefs looking to get to their first Super Bowl since the year I was born 50 years ago. Yes, it's been that long. Ouch. Um, they have Super Bowls that long? Here? They did. I thought you were older than that. So so we, we get there. If they get there, or if they don't, I should say, if the Titans beat them, guys, in my view. Break them up. The Titans, the Titans' <laughs> run to the Super Bowl will have been the greatest three-game stretch in playoff history. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Travis Henry, the numbers he's putting up right now, you know, the Chiefs are at the bottom of the league in run defense. Well, he ran for 188 yards in Week 10 against them. Like, the Titans have already beat the Chiefs this year. Right. We've but already the, seen it. Everything went perfect in that game for them to win that game. So I think that they're going to have to have a similar – scenario today where if they're going to win this game today the same thing they're going to have to have the ball last down a few points get in there and give the chiefs no time left on the clock in order to win this game well yeah. there's your game plan what do we do in week 10 <laughs> do it again do it again do, do exactly. it again run it back but just in case people think i'm crazy for talking about the titans that way again they will have beat the super bowl oh. defending champions they will have beat the number one team number one seed, seed in the afc and they will have beat the chiefs on the road so three games in a row on the road mm -hmm. that hill to climb i still think it's tough you got a big big game it's possible. today but it's possible if they do it they're going to go down again not as one of the greatest teams in history but one of the greatest playoff runs in history in my view but i see i don't it's going to be tough for them to do that i just i think they can do it do you? i mean it why? begins and ends with derrick henry that's why yeah, and uh, you know, at one point the Titans gave up second most sacks in the league, and Ryan Tannehill had fumbled five games in a row. Um, you know, but they've continually gotten better each week, and they they keep finding a way to win. Um, I just 
for me, defense and, and uh, running the ball wins you games. And they did a – you remember Teresa Walker, your Tennessee uh, – we had her on before the Raider game, the Tennessee yeah. AP sports writer. And she talked about the balance that the Titans were, were playing with and, um, since they made that move to Tannehill. And uh, that took the pressure off Derrick Henry in that run game. And, and Tannehill was – able to complete passes and keep the offense out there longer. And that took the pressure off the defense. And, and now they've rounded into a complete team. And I think they, you know, just the way they're going right now, I think they got a really good chance at, at uh, pulling off the upset today. Oh, I do too. I mean, like I said, we've already seen him beat him once. I think this is going to be a good game. Unlike Scott. Um, I, but see, now he's got me thinking about this. I'd have to look at the giants run when they beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Cause let's be honest. The, the first game in this run for Tennessee, they beat a corpse that was known as the New England Patriots. Yeah, That, te- that team, I won't even say they limped into the playoffs. They got hit by a bus and were drugged into the playoffs. <laughs> well, the playoffs. air went out of their football, no pun intended, after they lost that game to Miami. Well, it was even before, even before Yeah, but that, you go into a – look, I, I'm not, I'm not it, discounting that at all, but you go into a wild card game in Foxborough, I don't care if they're declined or not, it's still a tough game. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, I know, I know, but I'm not. I'm saying, but I mean, it's like you look at the Giants, the Giants who had run. a who that's had fair. a wild that's card fair. run, beat the Patriots at the height. Yes, so that's why I just kind of. But that was I'm in curious. the Super Bowl. Well, yeah, but that's part of a playoff run, right? But I'm saying, but I'm saying the three games to get you there. Okay, so you take out the first, you do the Super Bowl in the last two games in the NFC for the Giants. <laughs> <laughs> that's the fair enough, fair enough. Uh, but no, um, yeah, I, like I said, I I think you know, I mean, Tennessee's got the formula because Kansas City's defense is not very good. Right. The only problem Tennessee has is um, if Kansas City drops. Instead of the 28 they dropped in the second quarter, if they dropped 21, mm-hmm. now you have to make some throws. Right. right. It's hard right. to dig out That's, of that avalanche yeah. when it hits you. Yeah, and you got to you know, yeah. play with fire when you get behind That's a lot. It's tough in the playoffs. Now, um, the other thing I was going to ask, so NFC, I think to me, no one is giving Green Bay a chance. I know you aren't they either. Because they don't have one. You, you're not giving them a chance either. Uh, nope. Kelly, what do you think? I think they get destroyed. It's like, <laughs> guess what? We've seen this before. When you lose by 30 – you usually yeah. don't come back and beat the team the next time. Well, right? you know, th- yeah, but their credit, they they said they weren't prepared for that game. They're out on that West Coast swing. They were just kind of messing around out there. I, you know, I, I think it, they've seen that first pitch, and now they know what they're dealing with, right? I feel like it's they're going to come back. Mm. It, yeah, it, they it, they saw the first pitch and they couldn't hit it. So yeah. guess what? They're going to have. They're going to. They've been see practicing. They've been practicing. They're going to so, so see they this had their first at bat. I'm sorry. Yeah. Now they're their second at bat. They're going to have a better at bat. But yeah, I, been, I think it all rests on Aaron Jones. To be honest with you, Aaron, Aaron, Aaron Rodgers better. Aaron Rodgers are under his jersey. Obviously, is the key. Well, but if Aaron Jones shows up, it's over. They, I mean. <laughs> Isn't he, who's their running back? Aaron Jones. Okay, yeah. that's what I'm saying. I think it rests on his shoulders. If he has a great game, they can come out of there. I, you know, I, I never trust Jimmy G, to be honest with you, until they got Emmanuel Sanders, and all of a sudden he perked up. But, you know, he's got to prove something, and Aaron Rodgers well, has already proved it. But I think, and I, I know we're going to get to our picks at the end of the show, but I think that um, the 49ers win this game like they do last week, which is they have to run the ball. And the, the, the Packers are not great. They were 22nd against the run in mm-hmm. the regular season. They're fourth in the postseason. Uh, and so the, while they played a little better in the postseason, I just think you know Jimmy Garoppolo is not going to light up the scoreboard. Right. you got to limit his opportunity to make mistakes. Carl Shanahan did a great job of that last week of saying, you know what, I'm not going to let this guy. He made a mistake. He drew back. He went to running the ball, and it worked. And I think that's what they're going to have to do against the Packers today yeah, as well. They will. The one thing the 49ers offense does really good is that short passing game, which keeps the defense. Like, the the Smith brothers, Darius and Preston from uh, Green Bay, they're not going to be able to get a ton of pressure on Garoppolo because he gets, ball so qu- gets rid of the ball so quickly. Mm-hmm. That's the big part of the Packers, de- you know, big part of the Packers defense because their secondary is okay. I mean, they'll make some plays. But it's not like you're you're not going deep on him. You're not doing deep routes. You know you're beating him. Garoppolo's la he was at points or it was a uh, six yards. His average depth of target six yards one of the last in football. Right. But they average over six yards after the catch. Right. So that's what they do. They're going to be able to run the ball. They're going to have the short passing game. So and they got the they got the defense. So yeah. Yep. So I, I think I think that game's over. Yep. All right. And I well, hate the Niners. Well, we're gonna so. get we're gonna get to our specific picks towards the end of the show but between now and then after we come back from the break it's going to be time for kelly's corner hell hath no fury like kelly and his corner you're listening to the silver and black today here on cbs sports radio 1140 today live on cbs sports radio 1140 
Here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Welcome back to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. We are in the home stretch, taking you up to 10 o'clock here as we cover Raiders football like nobody else in Las Vegas. Check out our website, silverandblacktoday.com. Been a little crazy up there with the stories, not only on the NFL bias against the Raiders when it comes to penalties, uh, but then, and of course, in the Hall of Fames, yes. And then also, uh, we had several stories this week on the roof situation with Allegiant Stadium, so check that out. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel, as well as uh, Twitter, at Silver Black, the number two day, Silver Black Today, there as well, Facebook, and everywhere else you find your content. So make sure you do that. All right, we're going to now turn over the airwaves, these valuable airwaves, <laughs> These intercom CBS Sports Radio 1140 airwaves Valuable. to <laughs> a one Kelly Kreiner who has the the segment that everybody looks forward to every week because you just never know where it's going to go and that's what makes it so great uh, and that is of course for <laughs> Kelly's Corner with Kelly Kreiner. Kelly's Corner brought to you by no uh, one. Yeah, because because my thoughts can't be bought or sponsored. <laughs> Actually, they can, and it's not that expensive. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, I was originally had a plan to watch the Aaron Ru- or Aaron Hernandez Netflix documentary and do my corner on that. I went home last night, you know, got Netflix, got up on the computer, and I mean, it even popped up on the big like the first thing you shows up is yep. this you know big documentary. Blah, blah. I ended up watching like five episodes and nailed it instead. <laughs> um, I never thought that I'd be hooked on a cooking show because I always thought those things were stupid, but this is like the one that I really got into. But luckily for me, um, there's always something else to talk about in the world of sports, and I'm just going to start calling out some morons in the world of sports today. <laughs> and I'm starting with You're Frank. Moron. I'm starting out with Frank Clark of the Chiefs. Oh yeah, bulletin he, board material. Well, here's the thing: I've never bought into bulletin board material because if you're in the playoffs and you need something extra <laughs> besides the freaking playoffs, <laughs> right. you're probably a loser. You know, everybody's going to say they're going to do that. Oh, you know what? He gave me that extra juice. Oh, a Super Bowl and your paycheck isn't enough to get you to come out and play. You need some idiot on the other side to say that you're easy to tackle. Right. You know, and if he's so easy to tackle, why did he have 23 rushes for 188 yards in their first game when they played? A Chiefs loss, I might add. Yep. Obviously, probably not the easiest person to tackle. <laughs> you know who else is a moron? Odell Beckham Jr. Guess what, brother? It's not about you. I know you went to school at LSU, but right. you don't have to make yourself the center. Of, I, in your mind, I get it. You know, you're a little disappointed because now the world knows you're the second best wide receiver in Cleveland, <laughs> yeah. and he is the second best wide receiver in Cleveland. The second Cleveland figured out that out, their offense got a lot better the second half of the season. Very true. Okay. But to steal the to steal the megaphone from the band director was dumb. To slap the security guard on the butt was really stupid. You know, you can't do that stuff anymore, Mm -hmm. especially now. But the fact that you're pulling out wads of money and handing it to players is the ultimate just because that's that's the ultimate this is about me moment because you know that is an NCAA violation. You know LSU is getting in trouble for this. You know, Joe Burrow came out on the – podcast the pardon my take podcast said well i'm not a student athlete anymore so i can say yeah it was real i'm sorry joe but you're still enrolled in school you're still a student athlete because you're still on scholarship those are just blatant ncaa violations that odell beckham knows you can't do that he doesn't care because it's about me i am stealing your greatest moment and making it about me well and then and and then the the line you talked about the well it wasn't real money it's like that um, was the dumbest thing ever. Uh, hello, who has who has wads of fake money to begin with? Yes, like, I'm gonna, monopoly. Money. I'm gonna run. Right. I was gonna say I'm gonna. You can't even get monopoly money anymore. They've got a damn debit card on the games now. No, it's like how do you steal money in monopoly, which everybody did when you played monopoly? If you don't have money, you have a debit card. Uh, yes, and, and and by the way, Joe Burrow can say. And to your point, you made the point, and you're right that you are still a student athlete because you're enrolled in school. Even if you you're gonna leave and not yeah. graduate, doesn't matter. Uh, secondarily, though, the program can be hurt by it. So oh, and, it doesn't and matter, will. and they will be. It doesn't matter that it doesn't impact you. I mean, that's but that's where we are today. Is And Joe Burrow is a good kid, don't get me wrong. But the fact that people only, well, it's not going to bother me. 
Well, no, but that school that gave you the opportunity that you won that national championship at, they might lose scholarships. They might lose something else. You don't know. And so to me, it's just stupid to even think about it. And you know what? Limit the access. I understand OBJ, big, big alum. All right. Let him come in the locker room after the game. OK, mm -hmm. fine. But why does he get to roam around like like he runs the place? Yeah, yeah. your favorite player, Booger McFarlane, was running up and down the sidelines during player. the game. Oh, your yeah. favorite announcer. Yeah. You Booger know who McFarlane. was, you your know, favorite name the Booger, you know, who wasn't making an ass of themselves that went to LSU, the best wide receiver in Cleveland, Jarvis Landry. Right. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah. He's an alumni at the school. LSU's had a lot of I mean, they've had a lot of famous alumni and NFL players and stuff. You didn't see anybody else doing something like that. Right. Why not? Because they're not an idiot like Odell Beckham Jr. is. You know? <laughs> and I don't know if you saw it, but I believe it was JT the Brick on Twitter was talking about how Odell needs a bigger city than Cleveland. He was basically saying Vegas. Oh, no. The last thing I want to see as a Raider fan is Beckham out here. Yeah. That's Antonio because, Brown all over again. Well, no, actually, it's even worse, in my opinion, because you'll be stuck with OBJ. Right. You know, because... At this point, you know, you're going to have to give up, you know, a high draft pick to get him. He's got that massive contract nobody's going to want to take on, and you're going to get nothing for him. Right. You know, you ha at least Brown was dumb enough to believe that somebody else wanted him. <laughs> so he basically pushed himself out the door. You won't see that with Beckham. Right. Well, and Kenny King talked about, too, earlier when we talked to him, it's all about the younger Young players, you know, they're not going out and getting these hacky old veterans like they used to. You can really see the youth movement with the Raiders, so it's it's kind of nice to get these guys. And we, you know, Mike Mayock's down there at the uh, Senior Bowl now, talking with these guys and getting these high character players. So hopefully, we don't have a situation like an Antonio Brown or an Odell Beckham. But but, but you look at things, and and again, guys like Antonio Brown, guys like Beckham Jr., they're like crack for NFL personnel and coaches, coaches because yeah. they see instant talent that has been verified. They know when they play at the top of their game, they can be that guy. Yep. The problem is they overlook all the downsides that can destroy a season for you, i.e. Antonio Brown, what he I, did with the Raiders I can, offense. I can fix him. Right. Exactly. No, you can't. No. No one can. Crazy is crazy. And, and Chaz, you mentioned the getting younger. You do know that our new quarterback's going to be 43 years old, oh. right? I mean, <laughs> we, he, he, he was at an event in Vegas. That means he's coming here. Six rings. Yeah. I mean, do we want a guy with uh, six rings to come in and show us the way? I mean, like I said on Twitter, we've already got a guy that doesn't run and can't throw farther mm, yeah. than 10 yards. Why do we need another one? Yeah, that one's uh, baffling. We'll see how that shakes out. I just don't see it happening. I'm just glad we get to talk about that for the next six months. That's true. Every, every <laughs> weekend. Yeah. Well, Tom Brady uh, Tom Brady got on a plane. It might have went west. He's going to Vegas. <laughs> yes, and, and the, but that's going to be the, this whole off season. Every free agent that's in Vegas. By the way, they all come here anyway. They <laughs> yeah. did before the Raiders were approved to move here. Right. They were here for every fight. They're going to be here for every fight. Doesn't mean they're going to play here. Now. As Mike Mayock said earlier this week in his interview with Vic Tafer, mm -hmm. that he believes being in Las Vegas is going to increase interest in the Raiders for yep. free agents. And I don't disagree with that at all. Well, the zero tax. Yeah. That's that everybody brings that up. That's not as big a deal as you see. Thirteen percent in California, zero in Nevada. That's a pretty big deal. Yeah, but you're not going to choose. I mean, but what I'm saying, when it comes down to teams, cho like players choosing that stuff, mm -hmm. it's never as big a deal as you see. Or you'd have. So why doesn't more? Why don't more free agents go to Orlando? Right. You well, know, why don't more free agents go? Why didn't? Why did Dallas never get any free agents? No, you know, they do. Why? No, but they've never get big. Like you're going to get people, but the big name people. If it comes down to going to a good team or saving nine percent on your check. They're not taking the tax right. like no, you, like it's played out. You're coupling that to, with the fact that the Raiders are on the up, and when a when a guy has a decision to make, mm, do I want to go play for the Los Angeles Chargers or do I want to go play for the Las Vegas Raiders with zero tax? That might factor in because the Chargers are on the down, the Raiders are on the up. Do I want L.A. weather or do I want 120 degrees? Yeah, that's 120 a 120 that, degrees clearly. No, that's the other thing though. I mean, yeah, because everybody brings up the zero tax, but when you look at it, the like. Like I said, Texas, Florida, places like that, you don't see people like, uh, well, hey, man, these two deals are the same. I think but you I do. don't have to. We pay just taxes. don't talk about them enough. I think it does happen. Well, no, because that's the thing. We talk about it all the time, mm -hmm. 
and we never that's the thing we, we yeah, don't but, but, see it but, but it's talked about all the time but, but, here's but the you thing. never actually see it become I, that big of a deal i agree with nobody's you. ever came out and said you know why i went to there yeah of course zero tax no but i agree i agree with you partially and i'll tell you why because i don't think it's the one deciding factor absolutely not right but if i look at it and say team okay raiders iconic brand uh, no tax, great. I save a lot of money. Three, Las Vegas, opportunity, that kind of thing. I think Las Vegas, we live here, so it kind of loses a little bit of its luster to us because we're just we're around it every day. Mm -hmm. But for people, especially a young guy coming in looking at all these different opportunities, I think the, the that alone is different than let's say an Orlando, which doesn't have an NFL team, but even a Miami, <laughs> which which is you know different. You do know there are other sports. Besides I know, but I'm football, talking specifically. Right? They have I'm, free agency. I'm talking nah. specifically about well, football, but, though. but it, it's free agency. Doesn't matter really what sport it is. Right. It's. I mean, it's it's all the same. It's all the same construct. Yeah, but uh, uh, Alex Rodriguez it, mentioned when he signed with the Rangers. Part of the reason was. Because they overpaid him by fifty-two million dollars mm. more than any other team. But no, he, he also mentioned the tax situation. As but well. And then where he, did he play? He got an extra $52 million. Yes. but the, And it was tax-free. Correct. It, the taxes had nothing to do with that. It's if not that, what he said. No, that Okay. Yeah, he also said I'm just he, saying he what he said. said. He also said he didn't do steroids. <laughs> but guess what? He got offered 52, or actually it was more than 50, wasn't it 252? Yeah, that was huge. So it was like 70 million more than any other team offered him because the... Mariners offered him like 185 or 190. Yeah. Guess what? He, well, either way, zero taxes had nothing to do with him taking 60 million dollars right. for the same amount of work. Either way, Mayock said this is definitely a buzz about our move into Las Vegas. Could be one of the big stories of free agency. Now, that could yeah. just be PR. And, and you also mentioned Vegas. That's great if you're single, you don't have kids or a family. That's true because our schools suck. Anyway, all right, we're gonna step aside. When we come back, we're gonna pick the games today. Close it out with some other news about a labor deal in the NFL. Could it be at hand? We'll no. talk about that next on the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Welcome back to Silver and Black today here on Championship Sunday from Las Vegas. That's right. AFC NFC Championships coming up. Later on in the day, the Chiefs game is up first, followed by the Packers at 49ers. What a day for Raider fans because they hate the 49ers, they hate the Chiefs, so they, right. they're looking for a Titans-Packers Super Bowl. 100%. But is that going to happen? Uh, no. So we're going we're gonna to tell you what our picks are and what we think will happen uh, as we start off. Uh, here on uh, CBS Sports Radio. Okay, guys, so we look at this game. Let's start with the first game, which, of course, is the Chiefs hosting the Titans. Uh, Kelly, how do you see this one going? Uh, I think the Chiefs win a closer game than you or a lot of people think. Um, I just don't think Tennessee is going to be able to score enough. I've got it 31-24, Chiefs. 31-24, yeah. okay. I got it pretty similar. I think they, they need, like I said, the Titans need a repeat of that earlier season game where they get the ball right at the end. Um, you know, Tannehill can't make those throws. They obviously hasn't needed to the last couple of games. So, you know, it might rest on his shoulders a little bit more today. Um, but, you know, Henry's going to have a big game. Tannehill's going to make the throws. I want to bet the money line and take Tennessee, but I've, I'm taking the seven and a half. I got the Titans. Well, um, I hope you already got it because it's down to six and a half. Yeah, I did. Okay, good. And, Moving down. Um, as far as the final score, I'm going to go Tennessee, you know, 28-27, something like that. Wow. All right. Well, I have uh, – my score is actually similar so to wait, you Kelly's. So, you think Tennessee's winning the game? Yep. He does. Okay, he just gotcha. said that. Yeah. Well, no, he said he was taking the points. He wanted to like, well, – No, I said I want to bet the, the money. Oh, okay. He said the score. But I took the points just in case. Just in case. You, wait, wait, wait. They might not score. On, when they get that last possession, they might not score, and then the Chiefs end up winning by four or five. <laughs> way to have conviction. <laughs> <laughs> got to say, hey, got to take those points when you, you gotta, get them. You, you got to try to make money, right? Special, I mean, especially the seven and a half. Yeah. If you get anything <laughs> over that touchdown, you're, not, you're grabbing that. All right, well, I'm going with Chiefs 31, Titans 13. Um, I think the, the, the environment and uh, the run for the Titans, as good as it's been, as nice as it's been, I think uh, despite uh, Derrick Henry, who I think will still have a good day, I think you're right, Kelly, I think they're going to have trouble scoring. Clearly, I think they're going to have more trouble scoring uh, than you do, but um, I just think the Chiefs, uh, with this game, are, are positioned well to do it, and um, Patrick Mahomes continues to play really, really well, and he's going to lead them on that one, so 31-13 on that. Um, all right, so now we switch to the NFC. 
Chaz, and we look at the Packers versus the 49ers. 49ers, to me, have been underrated most of the year. They got in the playoffs, um, and I say underrated, I should say underappreciated. Yeah. Um, and when they when they come into this game hosting the NFC Championship game in San Francisco at Levi Stadium, um, I think that you know they 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 just have more uh, talent and tools than the the Packers do, even though the quarterback for the Packers is better than Jeremy Garoppolo. It's just a fact. Yeah, but when you watch that defense, boy, they just take it up to another level. And um, you know, I I don't. Obviously, I don't want the 49ers. I didn't grow up as an Oakland, you know, in Oakland, so I don't hate the 49ers as much as the Oakland Raider fans did. You know, I, <laughs> obviously, I just hate the old AFC West, Seattle Seahawks included. But um, I, um, I just have to go with my heart, not my brain, and say that the uh, Packers are going to win. Wow, <laughs> two Packers. upsets today. <laughs> Packers, and what's the what's the score? Um, well, that one's going to be a low one. That's going to be a 24-21 kind of scenario. 21. Hopefully, um, you know, like I said, Aaron Jones runs that ball well for uh, Green Bay. And uh, Aaron Rodgers makes a couple of throws here and there on third downs when they need it. And they, they kind of use the Tennessee blueprint. Kelly. 31-17, 49ers. And, oh. I'm, and I'm factoring that 17 as a meaningless touchdown for Green Bay at the end of the game. I think the four. I mean, we saw the 49ers smash them once already Destroyed. this year. I mean, that game was, I mean, that game was never close. I'm kind of expecting the same thing. You know, Green Bay's shown me really I thought Green Bay I I've said it the whole time. <laughs> I don't all season. I don't think Green Bay's very good. I know. I have a good friend of mine who's a professional sports better who has a Green Bay Super Bowl future from the beginning of the season and we were joking about it at the national championship game. He's like, This is the worst team I've ever bet on for a future and I'm still alive. Right. So it's like, yeah, we neither I mean they're not good, but they keep winning. Then that ends today. Yeah. I, I I don't disagree. I had them I had the 49ers 28 Packers 17 uh in that one. And I really I said it earlier guys. I think San Francisco will win this game much like they did last week. They're going to run the ball. Mm -hmm. I think Jimmy Garoppolo that short passing game that Kelly referenced earlier coupled with the running game because Green Bay is not great against the run, yep. which then if that all if our predictions went well with the exception of Chaz who has both underdogs, if both favorites win and go on to the Super Bowl, then I think the 49ers have trouble because I think against the Chiefs who are going to put up points, even against the 49er defense, you're going to have to pass the ball more. That puts more pressure on Garoppolo. But let's take one game at a time. Yep. I just think that 49er running game against that Packers suspect defense against the run is really going to be the difference today. Um, and But I think I think both games will be tight early, and then I think you'll see both te home teams pull away towards the end. Right. That's usually what happens. The games, you know, there's so much pressure on both teams, and the, coming down to the championship game, they usually start off a little slow, right? Super Bowl, same thing. Yeah, same. Yeah, I was going to say, I really do not want to see a Tennessee 49ers Super Bowl. That, <laughs> I mean, the thought of that makes – I mean, I may not – well, no, I'll watch the Super Bowl. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I, I will not be excited to watch that yep. Super Bowl because it's just two teams that want to just run the ball and play defense. Mm -hmm. I do not want to watch – like that's cool. Week four purists love yeah. that. Yeah, I'm not a yeah. I know you're, you're right. Purist. I'm not a purist. No. I want I want my 42 pages of props, and I don't want to sit there and bet every <laughs> under, under bet every is. under prop and just all be all like, is this is gonna be fun? Yep. Hey, winning if you're winning them, it's fun. But I can tell yes. you right now, no Raider fans want to see a 49ers Chiefs Super Bowl. All right, and in other news, as we close out the show, um, Pro Football Talk reports a new labor deal. Quote is on uh, the ball is on the thirty yard line going in, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. saying that a source of knowledge of dynamics explained to PFT the ball is on the thirty yard line going in. Uh, hardly a done deal. Both the NFL and NFL Players Association regard the start of the new league year in March as a meaningful deadline and pressure point. Specific rules around uh, the labor deal that are in question include both franchise tag and transition tag, as well as other things like marijuana, testing for marijuana. So we'll see what happens with that, guys. We'll, we'll cover it over the next couple of weeks, but it should yeah. be interesting. It, in 10 weeks from now, it's going to be 10th and 30 from the 30th <laughs> deal. Because like, uh, the, franchi the franchise tag is a huge thing nobody talks about. Yeah, it's The players hate it. Yeah, They want it out of there. It's something that owners are going to fight for the marijuana thing. I I'll be shocked if it's not thrown out in this, right? Because I think the players, they'll give up a percentage point and they or whatever it, they, to get they it. They did it in baseball. Yeah. 
So, I mean, I think that's a done deal. But it's, yeah, they said, oh, they're on the 30. Okay, but money's always the last thing you hammer out, and that's the most important thing. That's right. So, congratulations. You knocked over the fact that you got all the dumb stuff out of the way. Yeah, you, you got you to get more substantive stuff. You got your parking passes done, and you got your you know your allotment for Band-Aids. Yep, awesome. Yeah, but now let's try to split up $9 billion worth of money. They're not in the red zone. No, they're on the thirty. They're not even they're on in the, the red 30. zone. Good point. Yeah. And no, it's hard that's to true. score when you get in the red zone. All right. Well, that's going to wrap up the show, Kelly, Chaz. As always, thank you. Yep. yep. Our pleasure. All right. Great to be here. Good we, time as always. We roll on, and we will be back next week as well. We'll talk about what happened in the games today. Bring you up to date on the latest Raider news and roster information, draft, you name it. Whatever we have happening here in Las Vegas, we will bring it to you here on the Silver and Black today. For Tuesday. our engineer, Trent Ogle, and for Chaz Osborne and Kelly Kreiner, I am Scott Cobranson. We'll talk to you guys on Tuesday, Silver and Black tonight, 6 to 7 p.m.